After raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus' popularity surged. When he entered the city of Jerusalem after this death-defying miracle, the masses lined the roads, praising Jesus as a conquering hero. See Matthew 21, 21 verses 6 through 11. But this alarmed the religious leaders, so they called an emergency meeting of the Sanhedrin in order to hear out the concerns of the chief priests and the Pharisees. We read that in John 11, verses 46 and 47. Fearing that the popularity of Jesus would disrupt the detente that had been reached between the ruthless government of Rome and the Jewish community, the religious leaders decided that arranging for Jesus to die was the prudent course to follow, John 11, verse 50. From that moment on, they plotted to find a way to trap Jesus. The goal was to set Jesus up so that he would be seen as a threat by the Roman authorities. That decision led to a peculiar conspiracy. A group of Herodians, the political supporters of Rome's appointed a ruler Herod Antipas joined with the Pharisees, a Jewish group who opposed Roman occupants and occupant occupation. Together, they devised a plan to trap Jesus with a question that would force him to respond in a way that would incite division between the Jews and the Roman authorities. See Matthew 22 verses 15 and 16. The setup began with false praise, hoping that would appeal to Jesus' ego and cause him to bluntly ans answer the question that they posed. They said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. That's Matthew twenty-two sixteen. Then they sprang the trap question. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? The Jews detested having to pay the tax. Those tax monies went directly into Caesar's coffers and were used to support pagan worship and a decadent lifestyle of the Roman aristocracy. If Jesus supported paying the tax, that would be an affront to the Jews. But if he answered by saying not to pay the tax, that would be an offense, an insurrection against the Roman government. Jesus knew what they were up to. He disarmed his adversaries by holding up a coin, the type that would be used for paying the tax. Whose image is on this? He asked. That's Matthew twenty-two twenty. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus answered, saying, Then render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. That's Matthew 22, verse 21. That much would have answered the question, but that's not where Jesus ended his response. He continued by saying, and render unto God that which is God's. That's Matthew 22, verse 21. Why do you suppose Jesus provided that extra phrase uh, in his uh, answer? The coin bore the image of Caesar, so it belonged to him. But what bears the image of God? The answer, of course, is that you and I are made in the image of God. That's Genesis 1.27. His image is embedded in us, and we, therefore, belong to God. <music>「Then do we render unto God that which is his? What would it mean for us to give ourselves to God? That question has arisen in the minds of mankind for centuries. An anonymous psalmist, for example, wrote, What shall I render unto you, Lord, for all the goodness you've given to me? Psalm 116.12. Of course, we are unable to repay God for his goodness, but we can respond with an attitude of gratitude. We can acknowledge that we, in fact, do belong to God. Rendering ourselves to God can manifest in various ways. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we are instructed to honor God with our bodies, avoiding sexual immora immorta immoralities, in recognition of our body being the temple of God. 
We can render ourselves to God in our finances, supporting God's ministries. See 1 Corinthians 9.11 and Galatians 6.6. 6. Rendering ourselves to God can mean committing scripture to memory and focusing on God's inspired word frequently. See Joshua 1.8 and Psalm 1.2. We give ourselves to God by giving thanks to him and praising his name, Psalm 100, verse 4. Giving to God that which is his involves recognizing that each of us was created by God and made in his image. Therefore, we belong to God. Accordingly, we acknowledge whose we are by striving to conform to the image of God's Son, Jesus, Romans 8, 29, and Colossians 3, 10. We give ourselves to God by not seeking this world's approval, but instead striving to bring glory to God. See James 4, verse 4. As a people belonging to God, we stand on the integrity of his word. We advance the cause of love and we influence the culture in which we live. See John 13, 35 and Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. As we reflect on what is required of us in order to render ourselves unto God, consider these questions for introspection, if you will. Question number one, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Question number two, how are you rendering yourself unto God? And question three, how are you falling short in turning yourself over to God? When Jesus held up the coin and said, render unto Caesar that which belongs to him, Jesus was recognizing the legitimacy of government, even governmental structures that, that are imperfect as a result of the flawed people who run them. Governments, after all, are subject to God's authority, Romans 13, 1, and social order requires government structure. But each of us also belongs to God. We owe allegiance to his way of living. We have been endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that have given a mind and a body to us to live as God directs. As we exercise the liberties God has given each of us, we need to consciously seek to be more Christ-like in every way, every day. We need to recognize the forces of spiritual darkness that permeate our world today and stand ready to resist, see Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. You and I are children of God, siblings of Jesus, see Romans 8, 17. We render ourselves to God by growing in the likeness of his son, Jesus, every hour of our lives. May we render ourselves to God in every aspect of our living. Music.